Hi guys, in this video, I'm going to explain in detail about Freud's law of spinal motion. Coming to the introduction, the Freud's laws are a set of three laws regarding the skeletal anatomy that guide physiotherapists and osteopathic medicine practitioners to identify various dysfunctions in the axial skeleton. So they are actually a set of three guiding principles or laws meant to describe the specific motions of the cervical, thoracic and your lumbar spine. And well, in fact, these laws are seen as simplistic, but they do provide a framework for from which a clinician can work. Coming to the history, these laws are named after Harrison Freight, DO, that is an osteopathy, he is an osteopathic practitioner and who established this uh, Freud's laws in 1918. The first two laws are described by Harrison Freud in 1918 and the third law was described by Nelson in 1948, 30 years after the foundation of formation of these two laws. And Freud found there is a certain relationship between the vertebral motions in three planes, that is your flexion extension plane or rotation plane and your lateral flexion and fried principles have, have been used as a model for spinal motions and spinal somatic dysfunctions for over under years. So coming to the three different laws, the first law states that when the spine is in neutral position, side bending and rotation occurs in opposite directions. This means that when there is a side flex, when the spine is in neutral position, if you are going to lateral flex towards your one side means there will be a rotation occurring in the opposite side. For example, if a person were to side bend or lateral flex towards the left side of the lumbar spine, the bodies of the L1 to L5 vertebrae would rotate towards the right. So for example, if you are going to lateral flex towards your left side means there will be some rotation occurring in the towards the right side. The first law typically applies to a group of vertebrae. And an example for type 1 somatic dysfunction is L1 to L3, spine is in a neutral and there will be rotation side flexion towards your right and there will be rotation towards your left. So this is how the first law describes. So mainly this law is observed in type 1 somatic dysfunctions where more than one vertebra are out of alignment and they cannot be returned to neutral by flexion or extension of the vertebrae. So type 1 somatic dysfunction occurs as a result of uh, like uh, in, in type 1 somatic dysfunction multiple vertebral bonds are involved. So whereas in type 2 dysfunction only a single vertebra will be having some malalignment or having some dysfunctions. So this is the diagrammatic representation representation In this you can able to see here the spine is laterally flexing towards the left side and there, we, there is some rotation towards occurring towards the right side. So this is how the first law explains. So if there is a left a rotation towards the left side means there will be some lateral flexion towards the right side. So this is when the spine is in neutral position. So the, First law explains a neutral spinal mechanics. And coming to the second law, the second law means when the spine will be in a non-neutral spine. So either it will be in a flex state or in an extended position. So the second law states that when the spine is in a non-neutral position, either flex or extended, side bending and rotation occurs in the same direction. That means when you are going to laterally flex towards your right side, see simultaneously the rotation will also occur in the towards the same side or same direction. For example, if a person were to rotate towards the left at T2 in a flexed or extended position, the T2 would also side bend towards the left side. So simultaneously, both your lateral flexion and rotation occurs in the same direction. And the second law typically applies to a single vertebrae. So this is the difference. So the main difference between the first law and second law is the first law will be occurring in a uh, neutral spine and 
the second law it will be in a non neutral spin either in a flexed or extended position and the first law will be can, can be applied only applicable only for a group of vertebrates and this second law applies to a single vertebrate and an example for type 2 somatic dysfunction is t9 spine is in an extended position side flexion towards your right and rotation also occurring towards the right so this is how you will be mentioning the dysfunctions somatic dysfunctions first you will be writing your segment then you will be uh, writing your movement first movement that is your extension or reflection or uh, in a neutral position then you will be uh, mentioning your side flexion towards which direction either right side or left side and then your rotation to which direction either your left side or right side so in this diagram you can clearly see when when the spine is in flexed or extended position lateral flexion towards the left will be accompanied by your rotation towards the left so this is another, another picture so right rotation and right side bending occurs simultaneously this is all about second law and the first and second law are only applicable for your thoracic and your lumbar spines and the third law which was put forward by nelson in 1948 can be applicable for your all spine including your cervical spine so this is the another summary for your first and second laws so when the spine is in neutral position rotation will be occurring exactly opposite direction towards the then your side flexion and second principle in, in your flexion when the spine is in a non neutral position that is either in your flexion or extension position rotation and your side flexion or lateral flexion will be occurring in the same direction coming to the third law which was put forward by nelson in 1948 uh, 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 that is about 30 years after the formulation of first and second law by uh, harrison fried the third law describes the modification of spinal motions when the vertebra is moved through multiple planes of motions initiating the movement at a vertebral segment in one plane of motion will limit the mobility of the segment in the other two planes of motions for example side bending to the left side will limit the ability to rotate and to flex or extend the spine So this law states that a vertebra moving away from the neutral in one plane of motion will have less motion in the other planes for example a vertebra is in a neutral position that is neither flexed nor extended it can rotate through wide range of motions so that is in a neutral that is the, that is in the case of neutral spine with flexion the amplitude of rotational range of motion is reduced with flexion and side bending again the rotational range will be even more reduced so this is relevant to practitioners applying the manipulative techniques to the spine so when finding the direct barriers of a dysfunctional vertebrae the practitioner will notice that the barrier of the last plane of motion will require less motion or very little motions So in the third law they are mainly saying that if if one motion is occurring in one plane the remaining plane motions will be getting restricted or even getting reduced for example if there is a flexion or extension happening the the in the spine in particular spine for example in thoracic spine there is flexion happening definitely the extension definitely the lateral flexion as well as your rotation range will be less comparing to your flexion range so this is how the third law is designed and for example a thoracic vertebra is that is already flexed and side bent to the direct barriers in those planes will require little rotation to complete the positioning for a direct manipulating techniques knowing this can help the practitioners preventing the injury during manipulation so in this uh, third law you can able to see uh, we will be we can uh, brush up some your some of your planes movements occurring in different planes like in frontal plane there will be a lateral flexion occurring and in the sagittal plane flexion extension motions will be occurring and in the transverse plane the rotation motions will be occurring so for example there are two motions either your flexion or 
an extension motion if you are doing a flexion or extension motion so in if you are doing an extension motion that is occurring in a sagittal plane so motion in other planes will be getting limited or reduced that means if you are doing an extension motion your side flexion as well as your rotation motion will be getting uh, reduced or limited so this is how your third law is designed or the third law states so that means when the motion is introduced in one plane it will either modify or reduce the motion in the uh, other two planes so the third principle sums up the other two laws by stating that dysfunction in one plane will negatively affects all the other planes of motion for example if the person is having an issues during extension all your lateral flexion as well as your flexion as well as your rotation also will be getting affected so motion in one plane is affecting means motions in the other planes other two planes are also getting affected so this is how the third law nelson had explained so coming to the summary so fried so there are three laws or there are three principles of spinal motions uh, in the first principle you can say that when the spine is in a neutral neutral uh, position and the second principle when the spine is in a non neutral position and the third principle that is a combination of or adding or some sum, summation of all your first principle as well as your second principles the first principle states that when the spine is in a neutral position uh, side flexion or lateral flexion towards one side will be occurring uh, the rotation will be occurring in the opposite side or opposite directions and second principle states that when the spine is in non neutral position either in your flexion or extension position side flexion to one side will be accompanied by a rotation towards the same side or same directions and the third principle or the third principles of uh, spinal motions says that when there is one motion occurring in one plane the other two planes motions will be getting reduced or limited so for example in this you can see when the spine is in an extended position that is in a sagittal plane the other two planes your transverse plane as well as your frontal plane motions will be limited or getting reduced so this is all about three laws of spinal motions that is fried's laws three fried's three principles of spinal motions thank you for watching this video please do subscribe and share this video to your physio friends and fraternity thank you